Um, I would think that if he's healthy and ready to go, uh, which I don't expect to happen, um, they would probably go go with Bradford if that was the case. Because I still think, and I thought this all along, that there's more upside for Chip Kelly and the Eagles if Sam Bradford can blossom somehow in a way he hasn't yet in this offense. I mean, if he played as well um, in, you know, upcoming weeks as he played in, in Dallas the week before, and really he played pretty well uh, in the game against Miami, we'll never know what would have happened if he'd been able to play the whole game. But, I mean, they they still – their chances of getting a uh, Super Bowl caliber quarterback out of the situation – are still better, I think, with Sam Bradford, you know, putting all the, you know, all the, all the, the parts of the puzzle together in this offense. Um, if he can do that, Chip Kelly's gamble here that this could be uh, a shortcut to getting a franchise type quarterback can still work out. Um, I don't think Bra- uh, that Sanchez, I'm sorry, I don't think Sanchez is that kind of guy at this point, if he ever was. So, um, you know, there may be some interest in it. Um, you know, he seemed to run the offense a little faster last week. But, you know, the knock on Sanchez was and always has been that he'll throw uh, an interception at the worst possible moment. And that's exactly what he did. The idea that he's suddenly going to stop doing that seems a little bit far-fetched to me. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, that, that's what his kind of M.O. is, and that's kind of what he uh, has been known to do. I guess the question would be, if that's the situation – you know, do you just take the points there? Do you look at Chip Kelly and say, hey, know your personnel, just kick a field goal there, you get the lead? Yeah, I mean, I think it's uh, – I mean, there was enough time left in the game that it made sense to run a play or two. And, you know, if you yeah, kick a field goal on second down or just run in the line of scrimmage twice and kick a field goal on fourth down and don't really try to score the touchdown and Miami comes back and kicks a field goal to beat you, then everybody's going to be talking about how you screwed that up that way. Um, I, I can see running a safe play or two to try to get it into the end zone and take the bigger lead. That was what Kelly said they were trying to do. That makes sense to me. Um, a play call that rolls Mark Sanchez out to his left and forces him to make a, a read and a quick decision, that's probably not the smartest play call in the world in that situation. If you're trying to get the touchdown, you know you can do it in other ways. Um, the fact is that the play call, I mean, Pat Shermer defended the play call by saying basically, you know, there's several options and uh, most of them are safe. And Sanchez happened to take the riskiest option and make a bad throw on top of that. And even if Miles Austin had, had you know, made an effort at the ball, it still might not have been intercepted. So a lot of things had to go wrong after the play call, but the play call certainly set those, uh, all those uh, elements in motion. Yeah, I know uh, a lot of people questioned um, the receiver on the play, too, Miles Austin, whether he ran. And if you watch afterwards, Phil, you see Sanchez kind of take a couple steps and just kind of put his hands up like, what are you doing, Miles? Like, what are you So do you put some blame uh, or more blame? Because it seemed like Kelly wasn't willing to do that on Miles Austin. Yeah, well, Kelly said that, that Austin is coming across and kind of reading the coverage. And based on what he saw, Austin's not expecting the ball because it didn't look to him like that would be the right read. So Kelly kind of said it was the wrong it was the wrong throw for Sanchez to make in the situation. Um, and it wasn't a good throw. I mean, if he threw it, you know, in Austin's hands and Austin bobbled it and let it get intercepted, I would put more on Austin in that regard. You know, the ball, you're not expecting it. It doesn't look like it should be coming to you based on, on the read and what you know the quarterback should, should be deciding there. And it goes over your head. I and mean, that's a lot of, you know, moving parts there where Austin has to make a quick decision. Yeah, you'd like to see the effort in any case. Um, you know, if the ball is near you, there's a lot of wide receivers around the NFL. So if the ball is near them, they either catch it or come awfully close to catching it or certainly make sure nobody else catches it. Um, the Eagles don't seem to have a lot of those guys. And uh, clearly Miles Austin is not one of those guys. No, he's not. Phil Sheridan's with us here, ESPN.com, <laughs> NFL Nation, covering this Eagles team. I want to ask you, you wrote a piece about Jason Kelsey, and it seems that he is really frustrated. He even said, when I play well, we seem to win, and when I don't play well, it seems like things aren't going well. How important is Jason Kelsey? It seems like, you know, that 
um, it's a little undervalued about how important because everybody just takes for granted that he's been so good. Why is he struggling? Is it a, is it different? Are they asking him to do different things? Is he just not the same player? Have injuries kind of caught up to him? Uh, why do you surmise Kelsey is really frustrated and struggling? That's a great question. And, uh, you know, it was interesting. After the game, he was really upset and frustrated looking. Um, Tuesday in the, in the locker room, he had watched the film, and he basically decided, hey, you know, I wasn't as bad as I thought I was. And he made some mistakes. In a couple of cases, he just flat out got beat by Ndamukong, too, and that's going to happen. Um, he's always going to be an undersized guy, a little bit lighter than some centers. And a big physical guy like Sue or like McCoy, uh, Tampa Bay's equivalent to Sue uh, this week. I mean, those kind of guys are you know, going to be able to knock him back a little bit. But uh, I think the, big, the, the biggest thing is that, you know, last year and really for his whole career, Kelsey was playing between basically Evan Mathis and Todd Harriman. And a little bit of difference here and there with different guys being in and out of the lineup. But those were the two guys who were primarily the guards on either side of him. And in, in that case, he had two very reliable veteran guards who were good players, but also uh, smart players who were, you know, able to, you know, if Kelsey made a mistake or went the wrong way, they were able to pick up on that and maybe correct the mistake, maybe, you know, fill in. You know, if Kelsey should have gone to his left and he went to his right, uh, you know, Masters is a guy who could say, all right, Jason made a mistake. I can take care of that, you know. And now he's got two guards in Tobin and Alan Barber who are, you know, very, very fortunate to be able to do their own job. And uh, they're not going to be able to fill in or, you know, correct a mistake that Jason Kelsey makes. So every time they, every time Kelsey does make even a small mistake, you know, the quarterback gets hit or the running back gets stuffed in the backfield. I mean, there's nobody there to cover for a mistake, not just his mistakes, but along the whole line. Anybody on the line makes a mistake, you know, it, it ends in disaster on that particular play. And I think that's all kind of added up to Kelsey's frustration. He is making more mistakes than he typically has made in his career. And he flat out says that himself. Um, those are the kind of things that we don't all recognize right away if the center is doing it. You can see, you know, when a quarterback doesn't throw a lot of interceptions, so somebody starts to make bad, just, uh, you know, bad choices, and bad decisions, and bad throws, and throws a bunch of interceptions. That's obvious to everybody. When a center gets into a slump, you know, it's not that clear what's going on because so much of what they really do is not that, you know, obvious to us watching from the television angles and stuff. We don't see the plays from the uh, coaches' uh, end zone angles and know what the assignments even are. So, you know, he's a guy who's frustrated. I think the change with the guards um, and, and the fact that they're not, they're not quite as familiar is part of it, but also that they're not guys who are able to assess what's happening quickly and maybe cover for some mistakes. I think that's also part of it. Uh, Phil, we know the numbers on Cooper and Austin were not very good, and um, I don't believe either one of them had a catch. In fact, I know they didn't. Uh, Kelly said Cooper wasn't targeted. That's not his fault. You know, he he kind of defended that they have enough talented outside wide receiver. I, I, I think if you ask Kelly in a room that nobody would get the answer, he'd probably, you know, say no to that. But is there any thought that they might be looking around or, or is there anything they can do or is this basically what they got? I know, uh, you know, you're looking at the free agent market. You're probably not going to find too many guys that are running around that can run and catch. Uh, but do, do they – uh, at least have to explore making some changes at wide receiver, or can they not do it? I just think it's hard to do. Um, first of all, you're not going to get, as you said, you're not going to get great talent available at this point in the year. Um, you know, you go out and find a really special guy, you know, that would be fine, but it's not likely. You can look around at other teams' practice squads, and you might, you might get a guy that's got, you know, potential, didn't quite make a team, but he's, you know, on the edge of being a, an NFL player. You might be able to find a guy like that, um, and that, that typically happens late in the year. They, they, they look for guys like that off other teams' practice squads. But to learn this offense and get acclimated to running the up-tempo thing, especially for a receiver, you got to run 40 yards downfield on a route, and then if the ball is incomplete, you got to run 40 yards and get back to the line of scrimmage, know the play that's coming, and run the correct route on the next down. I mean, it's really hard to, to do that. And to find a guy off the street who's going to learn the offense, learn all the nuances to running the offense, 
like we're just talking about Miles Austin, you know, he's reading the defense and seeing what's going on, and he's, he's deciding based on what he knows the quarterback's reads are that the ball's probably not coming to him. I mean, you've got to learn all that stuff. You're going to be a receiver in this offense. Uh, so it, it's going to be hard to do. Uh, you're not going to find, you know, much, much better wide receivers probably uh, available. And, you know, the, the unfortunate thing is that, you know, they've invested some uh, resources in wide receivers for the last couple of years. And they've taken a first round, a second round, a third round pick in the last two years at wide receiver. And only one of them, Jordan Matthews, is giving you that much at all. And uh, you know, he's had plenty of catches this year. Not a lot of yards uh, per catch. He's not a guy that's making a lot of big plays downfield. But, uh, and Riley Cooper, a guy that Chip Kelly re-signed and has basically made a starter for three years. Um, and Nelson Aguilar and uh, Josh Huff, you know, they are what, you, what you're looking at. They're not going to suddenly become – how, how much, know, Phil, has the, is the injury to Aguilar slowed him down? Another, could he possibly, you know, if he got healthy, could he pass some of these guys over? Could I, I feel like on third down that Bradford is staring Austin down as if that's the only guy he trusts. It, it's, very, it's almost mind-boggling that I'm watching him stare Miles Austin down. But could Aguilar, if he got healthy, kind of emerge? Or it, are you not seeing um, – the necessary skill set from him to really make that jump. I know rookie receivers, but that seems like it used to be the third year they really burst out on the scene, but that seems like that has kind of died out the last couple of years. You see a lot of rookies, uh, receivers contributing now. You do, and it's often happened that uh, the rookie receivers that, you know, in the second half of the season, they've gotten a little, you know, a little better acclimated to the league, how defenses play them, how to deal with the various coverages, and they learn their offenses a little better. And quarterbacks learn the receivers, you know, and, and get timing down with them a little better. The trouble for Aguilar is that, you know, he had like eight catches, I think. And he had like one game's worth of catches for the first four weeks of the season. Um, really was – he kind of disappeared, basically. And then at about the time he should have been starting to put the pieces, you know, together and maybe get a better feel for everything. You know, he missed a couple of weeks with the high ankle sprain. Um, so I don't know exactly where he is now. I don't think he's 100%. He didn't look like that uh, in the game the other day. But um, if he's going to play, they're going to have to try to find a way to get something out of him because they're not getting anything out of anybody else uh, except Jordan Matthews, and he's going to play in the slot. So somebody on the outside has got to be able to catch the ball. You know, Chip's, Chip's excuse that, well, you know, the way the defense was playing us, we knew that, you know, Inside, you know, the middle of the field, we'd be able to get the ball to the tight ends and the backs, and that was uh, a positive thing. As long as that's working, everything's fine. I mean, that sounds fine. You know, the first two years he was here, the leading receivers were Deshaun Jackson, Jeremy Macklin, in that order, uh, in 2013 and 2014. There were outside receivers. There were lots of, you know, X plays, a lot of down the field plays, a lot of throws to those guys. They got open. You know, if, if Riley Cooper's running – in a downfield on every on every play, and never open to the point where a quarterback sees him. That says something about Cooper. I mean, maybe the quarterbacks are making mistakes or failing to see him at some points. But if he was there and open all the time or a lot, I would think the ball would come his way at some point. It did. It did for Jeremy Macklin, and it did for Deshaun Jackson. Clearly, the wild side receivers are not good enough at this point. Uh, to warrant that kind of attention, and so they're not getting it. Yeah, and I guess the mystery of all this is Cooper had that productive year, and why was he able to be productive two years ago when it seemed like everybody was productive? You wrote the piece yesterday, Phil, that the offense has regressed since 2013. Well, that was the year that Cooper had a monster year. That was the year that this offense looked like, wow, this is a lot of fun, and it has not been a lot of fun. Uh, so a lot of regression, not only for Riley Cooper, but the entire offense as a whole. No, it's true, and it was it was bizarre because that that second half of 2013, you know, Foles became the starting quarterback, and they went seven and one. Foles threw the 27 touchdowns and only two interceptions. Um, since that time, three different quarterbacks, Foles, Sanchez, and Bradford, have all thrown about equal amount of touchdowns and interceptions. I mean, he had 27 and two in 2013 for half a season, a little more than half a season, with Foles. And since then, every quarterback, doesn't matter who's the quarterback, 
it's been about even. So I, some of that makes me wonder how much of that's all the quarterbacks, uh, how much of that might be the offense itself. You had, you know, in Deshaun Jackson and Jeremy Macklin, guys who could make you know, a lot of big plays downfield. Um, you know, there were plays in 2013. I remember writing about that at the time, too, that, you know, a lot of them, you know, it seemed like Bowles occasionally just chucked the ball as far as he could and, you know, either – a defensive back would fall down or turn the wrong way, and there would Cooper be, or there would Deshaun Jackson would be, and they get a 50-yard touchdown out of it. Um, I was just talking about this earlier that you know, two years ago in November was when Bulls you know got the job basically. Um, last year in November was when Sanchez got the job. You know, but two years ago Bulls went out, they went to Oakland, and he started that game. They threw seven touchdown passes, tying an NFL record. Um, at least two or three of those were absolutely fluke plays where. You know, he just chucked the ball as far as he could, and somehow or other it ended up being a long touchdown pass. So you're not getting those kind of plays. Um, you know, they have quarterbacks who, you know, I, I thought Sanchez last year was reluctant compared to Foles to throw deep. I thought Bradford was reluctant compared to anybody I've ever seen to throw the ball deep. So you know, these guys are getting away from that. Um, whether the receivers aren't good enough, you know, if you had Deshaun Jackson 40 yards downfield with his hand up in the air waving that he's open, Maybe that's a little bit more of a, uh, an inducement to go ahead and uh, take a chance. Uh, when you've got, you know, Aguilar or Miles Austin and they're not quite open and Riley Cooper's down there and they're not, he's not quite open, maybe that's why they're not throwing the ball deep. But, yeah, it all worked a lot better when that deep passing game was working. Yeah. I mean, every, every facet of the offense worked better. Uh, I said that a lot during the uh, height of the Foles mania there that, uh, hey, there was a lot of fluky things that seemed to be happening in the middle of that year that they really prospered from, and I thought you saw him had the growing pains last year that he wasn't getting those opportunities. And I guess, you know, that goes back into uh, the rat race that you talk about was, well, how much did Deshaun Jackson impact a lot of that offense and things like that. But, Phil, when you look at the, the, the receivers and the ones that he that are still here and he selected, Chip Kelly, that is, does it seem that maybe he had more faith in the run game and then elected to get receivers that were going to be more impactful in blocking and that they wouldn't be necessarily needed to be playmakers as much? I think there's an element of that. I think the other thing uh, that's sort of in the mix here is that two years ago when everything was you know going great guns for them, you know that was the year that all five offensive linemen played all 16 games and started all 16 games. Um, they didn't miss any time with any of them. Uh, this year, you have two backups basically starting a guard to begin with um, going into the season. And then, you know, Peters is this time. They've moved um, Lane Johnson to left tackle to, to replace him and put Dennis Kelly in the right tackle. So they've now destabilized the two tackle positions. The two guard spots are already destabilized. And as we talked about, with all that going on around them, Kelsey's not been playing his best. So, you know, there's an element with all of this that, you know, in two years ago they had this you know, tremendous stability on the offensive line, and the line got better and better as the season went on. Uh, LaShawn McCoy, you know, led the NFL in rushing that year, and Foles was able to throw the ball downfield with abandon. Uh, last year, injuries on the offensive line kind of started to get to Foles a little bit. He started getting hit a little more. As he got hit, he got less uh, aggressive and less assertive. Uh, the running game wasn't as good. Um, this year, you're basically seeing a continuation of that. Different quarterbacks different running back but an unstable line and an offense that just isn't quite ever seem to be hitting on all cylinders at the same time phil sheridan everybody espn.com's nfl nation the eagles take on the buccaneers this sunday you can listen to the game right here on 97.3 espn is obviously uh, a couple other quick jason peters what is your take on the uh, peters i know there were some reports that they wanted to activate him they didn't want to start him they seem to dispute that uh, I don't know if you were down on the field or had a feel for that on Sunday, but what is your take on the Peters uh, little mystery here? Yeah, that's been really strange. Um, he did not practice today, and that tells me there is some uh, some truth to the you – know, basically it was the Eagles' decision not to let him play Sunday. It, Peters went out and warmed up, and he said he felt a little better. They felt like, you know, he's not 100%. The problem is he hurt his back in Carolina, and what he did was pinch a nerve. And the nerve is affecting his leg. It goes to his spine muscle, and his legs aren't 100%. You know, the strength in his leg isn't there. So, you know, he may feel fine when he's not doing very much, but as soon as he starts to move, um, 
the leg weakens up and, uh, you know, not able to rely on your legs if you're an offensive lineman is, is going to be fatal to somebody, <laughs> probably the quarterback. So it's, it's, been, a, it's been a mystery, but um, it, the mystery is only getting deeper because, you know, at the, at this time last week, Jason said, yeah, I think it'll be about 50-50. Depends on how I feel Friday. And uh, he seemed to, like he was ready to go. Lane Johnson was under the impression that uh, Peters was going to play going into that game. This week, he's, you know, he's now not practicing. So he's actually taking a step back from last week. So I think there's a really good chance that we see Lane Johnson at left tackle again. Um, if not, it's going to be Jason Peters playing, you know, without having practice all week. And I'm not sure that's going to be really good for anybody either. All right, we'll uh, keep our eyes on that, and you can get more with uh, Phil Sheridan over at ESPN.com, NFL Nation, covering the Philadelphia Eagles. Uh, as Sam Bradford out today, uh, no practice for him, no Ryan Matthews today, and Jason Peters, three big names uh, not on the practice field. Thanks, Phil. Thank you, Mike.